Hello and welcome to this Bioprocess International Ask the Expert webcast. I'm your host, Leah Rosin, the online editor for Bioprocess International. Before we get started, just a couple of notes. This webcast is being recorded and will be made available for replay in the multimedia section of our website. We've muted the audio lines, but we welcome you to type in your questions for our speaker in the question answer window on your screen. After the presentation, we will begin the question answer portion and I will ask our speaker your questions. Your questions in the question and answer window will only be visible to myself and our speaker. So thank you for joining us today. It is now my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Horst Ruppach from Charles River Laboratories. Um, thank you. Um, it's a pleasure for me to be here today and uh, share with you uh, my thoughts on how we can ensure viral safety in the cell and gene therapy area through next generation sequencing. Um, so maybe um, let me start with a kind of statement I will make at the end of my presentation and maybe um, we can start at the very begin with this statement. So what I want to say at the end of my presentation is that NGS is a powerful multi-attributal viral risk mitigation tool for cells either used for production or as a product in the cell and gene therapy field. And to make it even a little bit more um, provocative or more, uh, um, you know, important is that I believe that NGS application, application is more a must than just an option, especially if you're uh, setting up a new process um, uh, in the cell and gene therapy field, field etc. So, with that said, um, I uh, um, want to start first with a short uh, summary. You know, what uh, when we're talking about cell and gene therapy, so in principle, you can make two, group, two groups, um, cell therapy, of course, and gene therapy. Um, when I'm talking about gene therapy, I'm in general talking about uh, uh, vectors which are used in vivo. And um, one can also more generalize carriers and where you use nucleic acid um, to manipulate cells. And uh, gene therapy is mainly uh, related to in vivo applications. So uh, to make that, uh, you use a carrier that is frequently a, a viral vector like adeno, AAV, etc. Or you use non-viral vectors, uh, plasmid, lipoplexus, etc. The other group is a uh, cell therapy, and even uh, within the cell therapy, you can make uh, subgroups. Uh, we can talk about autologous approaches or allergenic approaches, and again, you can re uh, further subgroup into unmodified uh, cell therapy and modified cell therapy. And I have given you a couple of examples here, um, uh, which can be used um, uh, in, in different modes. And what's most important also is that, of course, the carriers you can use for in vivo applications are also essential uh, in the cell therapy when you, we are talking about modified approaches. So with that, um, that means um, the, uh, uh, you have a highly diverse uh, uh, field of, of uh, products here. And I just try or will try to summarize to some level the risk uh, which comes with these um, uh, specific products here. So let's have more, a, a little bit a more detailed view on the risk profile of some specific or frequently applied uh, um, uh, gene, uh, gene or cell therapy products. So with the uh, gene uh, viral vectors uh, for in vivo application, you start typically with a production cell, and um, which produces the vectors which are then given to the uh, to the um, to the patient. And um, in order to do that, uh, you need you, you usually start with a, a cell line, and uh, you transfect the cell lines using plasmids, but that can also be viral vectors, in order to make it a production cell to create in the supernate and the vectors or any other carriers. Um, in addition, um, sometimes you need helper virus, not in all cases, but sometimes you need helper virus. So you need to produce these helper virus also using a specific cell line um, as an ancillary material in, in, in this uh, specific application here. And finally, 
uh, you are using media in all these different procedures here. And those media can still contain uh, critical materials like human or animal derived materials, which uh, be another risk um, for, for this specific application here. When I'm talking about risk, viral risk profile, you see already a couple of cells indicated here. And the cells uh, are definitely a great entry point for the virus to uh, enter the process and to, uh, if it uh, goes uh, worse, um, to join your product when it goes into the patient. So in the cell therapy uh, field, it's even more diverse and more, um, and the risk profile is even more um, expanded here. So what's important from the very beginning here is that uh, you are not starting with a cell line frequently, you are starting with pa a patient, or I should better say healthy donor cells. That is the starting material, and that is the difference between, uh, to the gene vector area where you start with cell lines. And the risk of those um, uh, uh, this, um, patient cells or donor cells is that they, from the very beginning, can harbor viruses. It can be latent virus, it can be um, uh, even new emerging virus, where, which you don't know yet about it. And, um, and what's also important with these cell lines is that they are highly susceptible uh, to human virus specific. And um, that's a specific and risk in the cell therapy area. Um, what's another point is that um, those cells are frequently um, susceptible to primary isolates or wild type viruses. One have to different this, re, differentiate this risk from, let's say, from the recombinant industry. We are using cell lines, and those cell lines are typically only, not only, but frequently uh, the highest risk comes from uh, also laboratory adapted strains uh, in this case and can grow up dramatically in those cells. However, here it's a little bit different, different and wild type virus may not grow up uh, at the very beginning. It may be slow virus, and it might be uh, really. Um, uh, you know, a low contamination level at the beginning. So, however, you know, uh, this is just a starting material you start with, but when we talk about the modified approaches, especially in the allergenic area, um, you frequently you manipul manipulate those cells, and for that you are using gene carriers like viral vectors, transposons, messenger RNA, etc. And at least uh, the viral vectors are produced on mammalian cells, so uh, this is uh, another way uh, the start material can be contaminated through uh, using viral vectors. I outlined the risk in the slide before. And this is, a, for instance, a, a CAR-T approach. If you go to the stem cells, you know, especially to the iPSC uh, approach, you start with the human tissue cells isolated from a, from a donor, and then you reprogram those cells to iPSCs, and typically, when you culture those iPSC, you you may need feeder cells to uh, keep the, the the status of the cells. And then you develop any kind of tissue out of these cells, uh, uh, which is after that given to the patient. So here you see again uh, a couple of cells already. Uh, which are part of the production process, which can be part of a production process of a cell product. And finally, and even more uh, important uh, in the cell therapy area is the um, use of media. Uh, and here uh, depends on you know which, which approach you apply. Um, those media frequently still contain uh, uh, important uh, materials like cytokines, hormones, growth factors, etc which can be human uh, or animal uh, uh, derived and be another risk. So if you just look on this uh, picture here or illustration here, you see there is uh, uh, many entry points for the virus um, to contaminate uh, the final product. So the risk profile is significant. So we, we know that from, from other uh, industry, biotech industry um, and uh, there are a couple of guidelines defining um, what uh, risk mitigation tools should be applied. And you can put them in, in, in four boxes here. The first is of course, of course is uh, physical and the hygiene uh, uh, approaches. 
you know, ensuring safe environment, governing uh, procedures, positive pressure, training of the people, a well, uh, sanit well uh, defined sanitization program, use of disposables, but also establishing maximal closed systems, including automation, can build a kind of barrier for the virus to enter your manufacturing process. Another box, which is very clear, is the use of critical materials. So critical materials means that can be the cells you use, definitely, but also any raw materials, any human or animal-derived raw materials, uh, which has the risk um, to bring in virus through this way. So therefore, it's very important to mitigate this risk to do carefully sourcing of those materials Ideally, you minimize the usage of uh, such materials. Maybe those materials can be pre-treated. You can build in some viral clearance that makes those materials more safe. And, but most important here is the characterization and deep testing of those materials. The other box is uh, monitor. While, you are, uh, while the process is running, you should do some intermediate testing. Uh, and also at the end, or kind of release testing, this should be uh, based on the risk assessment you have performed. And the final box, which I personally regard the most important box as a safety uh, tool here, is the viral clearance capacity of the downstream process to purify, uh, to, to remove or inactivate potential viral contaminants. So this slide just illustrates the barriers you can put in and which I just outlined in the slide before, and then I illustrated here is by putting in some uh, uh, pictures for, for the different barriers, um, how you can mitigate the risk for your final product. And just to make it a little bit more uh, um, uh, uh, obvious uh, how these um, risk mitigation tools looks like depending on the different type of products. Just have a look on the CHO-derived recombinants. So you know, on the uh, physical hygiene area, um, those processes are um, pretty much closed already. And uh, so they have a long time experience. Uh, by the way, I forgot to say the background, I hope you can see that is uh, low gray, which gives the uh, initial viral risk which comes uh, with such a kind of product. However, you can even further reduce this risk, uh, you know, having a closed system, long time experience with, uh, with the production process. Critical material is just, um, uh, most, in the most cases, is just uh, the cell bank, the cell you are using for the production, where uh, within the la last couple of years, it was possible to remove almost all animal or human derived material. Uh, like fetal cough serum, trypsin, etc. If you can avoid that, that barrier uh, contributes significantly to the safety of the product. Monitoring, that is a risk-based monitoring. You have some uh, uh, process, testing in the process. And that what makes it most important here for the show-derived recombinants, you have a um, extended uh, downstream process to purify uh, your product, but with this purification process, you bring in also significant cap capacity to remove or inactivate viruses. Typically, you have three or four steps, and all of them have capacity to remove the virus. So this brings the highest um, safety and is the highest barrier you can build in for any kind of product. So how does it look like uh, if you move to, let's say, a viral gene vector? Um, so the, the, uh, the ground risk here is, as I detailed in the, slides, in the slides before, is higher from the begin. Unfortunately, also the barriers you can bid in also uh, do not have the, um, the level um, compared to a recombinant protein. So for instance, uh, and and uh, on the physical hygiene area, there is still a lot of manual manipulation, uh, which bears some risk. With respect to the critical material, you're using um, 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 another cell line. You use a cell line, um, uh, which is much less um, characterized than the Cho cell line. And there are many deri derivatives um, from this cell line. And also the history is uh, frequently not well documented. So this barrier is reduced. Monitoring might be the same. Uh, viral clearance, yeah, there is some downstream purification for viral vectors. Uh, for AAV, it's 
probably more effective than for lentivirus, which is frequently just based on chromatory steps. However, it definitely does not reach the level of uh, uh, clearance capacity, which comes for a Cho bank, for a Cho-derived recombinant, where you frequently can put in a virus filtration step, which brings the most safety. But this is typically not possible for, uh, for gene vectors because you would also remove the vector itself. It's a little bit different for AAV, why, they are, um, why I would say this barrier might be higher for AAV, but for lentivirus, you definitely cannot use virus filtration. So that's the risk for viral vectors. Um, if you look in, uh, to um, the risk profile of um, cell therapy product, you may already see that uh, the viral clearance, you can forget about viral clearance. So there's no way, no downstream processing, uh, which brings in any clearance capacity. So this barrier is almost not existing here. And uh, with respect to the critical material, um, you saw that in the slide, and there are even more entry points for the virus to enter the process than for gene vectors. So these barriers are highly limited, as you can see, and the viral risk, however, from the very beginning, based on the start material you are using, etc., is definitely higher than compared to gene vectors or even compared to uh, recombinants, simply because you are using human cells uh, and primary cells in this process. So that makes it so important that you work on these barriers. So how can you increase the safety by increasing, for instance, putting in some physical uh, measurements, for instance, moving away from a manual, uh, from a, a, a process which is, uh, contains a lot of manual ma manipulation, moving to a more closed system, and the industry is moving into this direction. And um, the other important point here is uh, how can we um, mitigate the risk coming with the cells, but also coming with the raw materials used in the production of a cell therapy product. And that is for in, just to give you an uh, indication here, the USP uh, 1047 is saying that it is difficult because of the nature of the gene therapy vectors that is related to lentivirus, additional characterization of cells and animal-derived components used in the production process should be considered. So the critical material, uh, how can we mitigate the risk uh, of the critical material? That is a central, um, how should I say, uh, it's, it's, it's critical and crucial to uh, bring in viral safety to your cell therapy product or gene vector product. So coming back to the box I showed you for, before, uh, critical materials, how can you mitigate the risk here? You can do carefully sourcing, minimizing the usage of animal human derived materials, pretreatment of those raw materials, and um, finally characterization and testing. So sourcing, uh, that could be a presentation by itself. So unfortunately, I don't have the time to go deeper into this here. Um, however, and that is why I just brought up uh, the two major or most important guidance here uh, from, excuse me, uh, the FDA and uh, in the EU, uh, which give uh, indications and leads on how you can uh, ensure the, the, the safety of, let's say, in the cell therapy, uh, the um, donor cells. Uh, and these are not the only guidance uh, uh, which are out to ensure safety of the starting material when it's derived from humans. In the gene therapy area, I mentioned that already, you know, we are talking uh, gene vector area, we're talking with uh, about cell lines. Um, again, then the old, the, the well-established methods, you know, looking at the history of those cell lines, um, um, uh, avoiding use of animal materials in the pr uh, production of the parental cell lines, et cetera. Those things should be considered here uh, uh, in, uh, to ensure safety here. Uh, for the raw materials, in principle, the same, and because uh, those raw materials are very critic, critic, critical in the uh, cell and gene therapy area, uh, there are specific regulations uh, for using those materials in the cell and the, uh, gene therapy area. So uh, the USP 
1043 is imp uh, important here and also uh, the Euro uh, European Pharmacopeia 5.2.12, which gives specific recommendation how this risk should be addressed. Uh, unfortunately, it's really not identical between EU and US, so uh, it's reasonable to uh, look at both and uh, to define your own program. So, um, well, how, how can you mitigate this risk uh, of this critical material? So uh, what you can do is you can avoid and minimizing the use of critical material. Yes, you can uh, try to use media and those media are already available, which do not contain any animal derived materials. You can use recombinant cytokines or hormones produced on prokaryotic cell systems. So that means that brings already uh, some safety into. Uh, many cytokines and growth factors can be grown on this way. Uh, for another example is replacing feeder cells, moving to cell extracts, however the risk is still high, or even to move uh, to, move to recombinant uh, components uh, to replacing those feeder cells. And there are other uh, options. Uh, when you are using um, vectors, uh, for gene, for manipulation of the cell uh, product or uh, for in vivo applications, you know, um, right now the, the standard procedure is using a, a cell line which uh, you transfect with plasmids and then uh, you start producing your product. However, um, if you move to uh, packaging cell lines and even production cell lines, um, that can bring in some safety because you have more time to characterize those materials after transfection. Another way is to use other carriers than just viral vectors. It can be transposons, episomals, uh, vectors, etc. those kind of things. Anyway, all this would help to minimize the risk uh, uh, by just reducing um, the uh, animal or uh, human-derived materials um, uh, in this case. Pretreatment is another way you can uh, reduce the risk. Um, for instance, if you are using hormones or cytokines in the uh, media, which came from a mammalian cell line, you know, they have a downstream process, so they have a, a potential to clear uh, the virus in the production of those uh, uh, um, raw materials. And that should definitely be applied and should be documented in order to make those materials safe. Um, also, uh, that's the same uh, true for whether you're using trypsin, Calf serum or BSA, you know, um, they all need a purification step, and the purification step should have viral clearance capacity, which should be analyzed and documented. And um, also, pretty common now in the recombinant industry, uh, the media before you feed it into the bioreactor, uh, you can pre treat it, uh, short, heart, short heat treatment or uh, virus filtration have become more or less common now uh, to ensure that nothing is. Uh, moves into the fermenter uh, with any material which is added. So, and the last item is characterization and testing. And um, even though I, you know, we talked about sourcing, we're talking about uh, reducing, avoiding, and uh, pretreatment. Um, all this reduces the risk. However, um, many in, frequent, frequently it cannot be applied. Uh, you still need to use animal or human-derived materials. You know, you cannot avoid the most critical materials, the cells, which you use for production. So that cannot be avoided, and cells can also not be treated. And for this reason, uh, characterization and testing of the cells specifically is uh, uh, most important to bring the safety to, to, your, to your final product. And when we talk about testing or characterization um, with respect to viral safety, so uh, these are um, uh, the most important subject of testing, detection of known virus detection, ideally of unknown viruses, Identi identification of uh, viral contaminants, so not just detection, but also see what is the contaminant, um, maybe differentiate detection of infectious and non-infectious virus, 
the breadth of detection. So uh, what is the method you apply? How, uh, what is the capability of this method to address a broad range of different virus? And of course, the sensitivity is very critical also for, uh, if you apply testing. I put in some guidance here just for you to note um, uh, which describe some tools or some assays in some more detail which should be applied when you test or characterize your product. Um, it's, um, I just want to mention these are not the guidelines who define uh, the safety of, of, of any kind of biopharmaceuticals. Of course, they do as well, but there are others as well. But these I outlined here specifically give you a lead or information about what the assays should look like and um, give you some details how the assays should be applied. So at the end, um, maybe I uh, speed it up a little bit here. You know, these are the different tools which are currently used uh, to mitigate the risk, to characterize cell banks or any critical raw materials. So you have some general uh, assays like the in vitro assay or the in vivo message which screen for viruses. Um, you have more uh, uh, focused assays like retrovirus assays or re reverse transcriptase anal analysis assay, uh, both screen for retrovirus specifically. The TEM analysis is again a method which can in principle detect all viruses even unknown viruses. And then you have more specific assays like uh, the map hub rep assay, which screens for specific um, uh, uh, mouse derived or uh, uh, assays, and uh, or the test for bovine and pokan viruses, which is a cell-based assays. And of course, uh, using PCR as a single or in a multiplex approach to screen for very specific viruses. So I have summarized here in this table uh, the pro and cons of these different assays. And you can see uh, in, 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 in um, green uh, the, 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 the power or the, the um, I wouldn't say the power, but uh, what these assay can in principle provide. Uh, so they all can detect uh, uh, known viruses. For some of them, for the PCR, you know exactly what you are looking for. For the in vitro in vivo, you may not, uh, you know what the capabilities are in principle, et cetera. Um, not all assays can detect unknown virus. PCR is usually a targeted approach, so you just need to know what you are looking for. Whereas in vitro in vivo assay can also determine, uh, uh, define, uh, find um, uh, unknown viruses. However, if you get a positive result in those assays, uh, you usually do not know what is the, the strain, what is the virus itself. Um, that can, uh, and it, it requires follow-up assays to identify if those assays gets positive. Um, some assays are, uh, especially the cell-based or in vivo assays, um, if you get a positive hit here, as it means this must be an infectious virus, whereas if you get a positive hit by PCR, it still may be a non-infectious virus. When it comes to the breadth of the detection, all these methods have their limitations. Either they are specified or they cannot give a real uh, um, a specification which virus can be defined. They have maybe a, a specific panel of virus. We know that they can detect those virus, but uh, we don't know uh, what else they can detect. And if the strain is a little bit different, they may not detect the strain, uh, this virus. So the, the highest breadth of detection has a TEM. In fact, however, it has a lower sensitivity. So the uh, TEM, uh, the transmission electron microscopy, is definitely a method uh, where you can see any kind of virus. However, um, the sensitivity is in the range of 10 to 5, 10 to 6 uh, per ml. So you can imagine um, that is, uh, you need to have a high contamination level to see that in the TEM. In principle, the PCR has a higher sensitivity in, uh, in general. Um, for some virus, I, I would say that's the same for the in vitro and vivo assays. But um, um, the, uh, the downside with PCR is, again, it's a targeted approach, and um, which makes it a, a little bit more, uh, um, you know, that's a limitation of the PCR. 
So this is just an illustration, you know, the blue background should represent all mammalian virus which are in the world. And if you apply those assays, you open some windows. And by opening these windows, you may detect some of these virus. But as it is, please don't over -interpret, interpret this slide here, uh, just, just for illustration, you know, that you will definitely not detect all mammalian virus. You just will see or identify some of them. So I guess um, I can move over that. Um, 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 what I more or less what I said already. You know, uh, you use this mix of methods um, to mitigate the risk by characterization and testing. But all these methods have their pro and cons, and um, the total, uh, it's very important that you apply, um, depending on your risk assessment, uh, a couple of those methods in order to at least open uh, as much windows as possible. So now coming to the um, to NGS, next generation sequencing approaches. Uh, so I don't have the time to go deeper into the technology and that is not the intention of this presentation here. Uh, I should just summarize the uh, specifics of this assay. Is it screens for nucleotide sequences, so it can detect in principle any kind of sequence which is in your sample. It's a hypothesis-free approach, so that does not require any prior knowledge of sequence information, very different to the PCR. Um, and it can not only detect a potential contaminant, it will also immediately, because it's a sequencing approach, identify uh, the, the, the kind of virus. To the technology, you know, uh, there are different technology. It has evolved from the first generation to the fourth generation, and current systems have different features and use different technologies. The appropriateness is dictated by the application and the target. So that is what you need to keep in mind, whether you use very deep or less deep, but longer reads, etc. all this should be defined based on what is the target of your investigation. So the power of these technology has been uh, demonstrated in the past, and I just give you two examples here uh, where a, a virus, viral contaminant was found either in a vaccine which was on the market and all the tools I just talked about it were not able to detect the virus. So it was detected by NGS. And uh, another example is a production cell line, SF9, which is used for the production of recombinants. And until 2014, uh, we all thought it does not contain any viral contaminants, but when NGS was applied, a raptovirus was found. In both cases, those viruses were not critical for humans. Nevertheless, it shows the power of the NGS technology. And uh, here you see a couple of publications, it's just a selection of publications where NGS was investigated. Um, what are the character, what are the uh, characteristics of these technology when you uh, use it in the, uh, to, to screen for viral safety? And it was demonstrated in those papers, you know. Um, for instance, there was a study where um, uh, a couple of viruses were put into a sample and it was sent to different uh, uh, companies who provide uh, NGS solutions. And uh, they all were more or less able to detect the virus. They even found virus which were not put in because it was a contamination. And um, it was also shown in those papers that they can uh, uh, detect variants which would not be detected probably by PCR because the primers would not uh, fit to those variants. And it was shown that the sensitivity of these assays of NGS approaches can be uh, comparable to PCR. And for this reason, you know, um, uh, uh, and that was, you know, acknowledged by the regula regulatory agencies, um, and they changed some of these, or wouldn't say modified or reviewed, uh, some of the regulations, especially in the vaccine area, and they um, at least opened the possibility to use uh, this technology as an alternative for the tools I just outlined, especially specifically for the in vivo methods. The European Pharmacopeia has a specific chapter, 5.2.4, uh, which um, describes the conditions, how you can substitute in vivo methods by new methods, um, as, and it includes an NGS approach. 
in order to increase the quality uh, of vaccines. Again, I showed you um, that a vaccine which was four years on the market uh, was supposed to be negative, virus negative, and turned out to be positive based on the N NGS approach. And in addition to that, you know, the ICH-Q5A, which is, I would say, it's one of the most important guidelines um, that was uh, issued in 1997, uh, which describes what safety measurements should be taken into consideration when uh, you uh, um, want to reduce the virus safety risk of a biopharmaceutical uh, product. And this is currently in revision. And uh, um, I would expect maybe end of this year or maybe beginning of next year, the first draft will be uh, uh, co-published, will be published. And I'm pretty sure so uh, next generation sequencing will definitely be uh, included as a risk mitigation tool. There's an interest group, um, AVDTIG, uh, an industry group where regulators are and industry are coming together. They have some subgroups in order to address te technical uh, uh, challenges. And um, the, um, there's also uh, every two year, there's a conference where all these experts come together and discuss how NGS can be used in order to ensure viral safety of critical products. And uh, I would expect that the next conference uh, will be uh, end of this year. So coming back to, you remember the picture I showed you, uh, the table with the pro and cons of the different assays. And when you now look into NGS uh, approaches, you see that um, it has the same breath, it has a high breath of detection. It can in principle detect all viruses and the sensitivity is comparable to PCR. So it brings all the power um, um, we would need uh, to ensure that your product is virus free. And um, if you, I remember this illustration, you know, um, I'm perfectly, uh, I'm, I'm uh, somehow optimistic in this area, so it opens the window wide, maybe not completely, but very wide, because the breadth of detection uh, of NGS is the highest compared to all the tools we discussed before. And uh, however, the, um, the downside here is that it's a, a molecular biology-based method, so it can in principle not differentiate between um, um, these um, infectious and non-infectious viruses. Um, however, you know, uh, when we talk about next generation sequencing, we're talking about three different approaches. There is a viromic approach where you test supernatants for particle associated uh, uh, genomes. However, you, uh, if you get a positive hit, there can be DNA or RNA released from the cells, uh, which is not particle associated. So you cannot differentiate between infectious and non-infectious particles. If you, um, you can do the genome of a cell bank, um, of course, but there is a risk that you see some hits because it contains endogenous virus and you need to find out whether this has any relevance or not. And then the next one is a transcriptomic approach where you just analyze the messenger RNA produced by a cell. And if a messenger RNA is produced, that is a clear indication of a replicative active virus that means of infectious virus. And this way, you know, you close the gap here, detection or the differentiation of infectious from non-infectious virus by using the transcriptomic approach you are even able to differentiate uh, uh, this. And um, that means this method is the only method which uh, fills all the gaps and combines it with a, a very high breadth of detection and uh, uh, a high sensitivity, and a very high sensitivity. So coming back to, you remember the slides I showed you at the very beginning, um, and you saw the many, uh, the many um, cells I put in. So the cells are really, and I said that more than once, um, are definitely the most critical part. And, um, and the cells are used in the production of gene vectors. Uh, uh, it can be used for, it are used for oncolytic virus, helper virus, for the production of cytokines, growth, feeder cells, you know, and they can be the source uh, for any kind of tissue uh, derived from iPSCs. But cell substrates can also be 
you know, the product itself, uh, as outlined earlier already. And with that, you can say the cell substrate is the most risk material, and, you sh uh, and that is the reason why analyzing those cell substrates in uh, as deep as possible um, brings the highest safety to your product. And um, just a reminder uh, again, um, but um, I can switch over here because of the time, but uh, you know, these are just outlining the different risks. So I, I, it's just a repetition of what I said that uh, there are many entry points for the virus to replicate, uh, to, to, to go into the cells, to be, um, maybe they not uh, uh, replicate from the very beginning, but during the production process, they may be activated and then uh, may contaminate uh, the final product. And um, with that, I would like to summarize um, 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 and uh, what I um, uh, wanted to outline uh, with, these, uh, with my presentation here is, so cell substrates, I repeat it again and again, are critical and crucial components in the manufacturing process. Um, frequently you have cell banks um, or dedicated donor cells. Um, they are uh, the start material for multiple batches, especially in the allogenic approach for cell therapy pros, and uh, are the start material for the life cycle of a specific gene or cell ther therapy product. And as mentioned, uh, cell substrates are definitely the most critical enter point for viral contaminants. And because of this, um, you should apply the most advanced technologies to ensure to characterize cell substrates in order to ensure viral safety. Uh, and the agnostic approach of NGS based, especially the transcriptomic analysis, provides the highest breadth of detection at the sensitivity compared to PCR and can even differentiate infectious from non-infectious viruses. And um, the, that means the NGS transcriptomic approach is the most powerful technology so far to analyze and determine the viral risk of cell substrates used in the cell and gene therapy area. And uh, just for consideration is um, keep in mind the cell substrates can frequently be stored and can be comprehensively analyzed, characterized before use for production or further processing. So it does not delay your manufacturing process. You just need to take the time to analyze it most deeply. Um, so you have the time and if you find something, yes, you may find some hits. You should have, you have the time to investigate because it's not in a running process. Maybe that also a, a, a recommendation here is you should apply NGS at the earlier stage of the at development process. Maybe not for the production cell line, but for any kind of parental cell lines for IPCs uh, definitely uh, or on representative donor cells, etc. Because if you do that at the very, very beginning, you define the risk from the very beginning before entering the GMP process. That can be helpful. And it can be used if you have a full picture, you know, what is the risk of your starting material? It can justify subsequent viral testing programs. And with that, uh, I would like to finish and uh, just say that NGS is um, definitely not the only method, but right now I regard it as the most powerful tool to bring in safety to the most critical uh, material in the cell and gene therapy uh, area. It does not mean that the old methods uh, um, can be, uh, you know, are no more needed anymore. They, you may need them to confirm uh, or to uh, uh, a, a finding, you know, still important. And sometimes uh, you should use it as supplementary uh, assays to the NGS approach. And, but as I said at the very beginning, uh, NGS is definitely a powerful multi attribute virus risk mitigation tool for cells either used for production or as a product. And in order to mitigate the risk, the safety risk, of course, but also business risk, you should use this technology at the very early stage, uh, uh, which because that's a material which might be the base for all subsequent production uh, uh, for many batches you are going to produce out of that. And with that, I will let I say thank you and um, um, open for questions. Great.
So the first question is, do you think regulators will accept NGS approach in lieu of in vitro and in vivo adventitious agent assays? You mean to replace those assays? I'm not sure I got it right. Yes, to replace those assays. Okay, okay, sorry. Um, uh, I would say for the in vivo assays, uh, there are already some initiative um, to move away from the in vivo assays. In, in Europe, um, um, it's a little bit more progressing here because they have um, other directives, for instance, reducing the use of animals if there are alternative assays available. And uh, many, especially in the industry, but also as a crow, uh, providing service in this area, I can tell you, I can't remember to have seen any positive in vivo assays. And we have done a charge for many uh, um, in vivo assays. And uh, coming back to the paper I mentioned, you know, um, I would say the in vivo assays can definitely be replaced by NGS. Uh, for the in vitro assay, I'm a little bit more careful. I said already, yes, I said um, the NGS can differentiate infectious from non-infectious virus. But you know, especially if you characterize a cell and you get a hit, you may use the in vitro assay to confirm or not confirm uh, the finding. Um, because there are a couple of viruses, you know, they they may not be, um, they may, in a, in a different stage, in a latent stage, which means they may uh, produce only very limited amount from messenger RNA. Uh, if you know the virus, if you know about the virus and the sequence gives you this information, you can still see whether it's a, in a latent phase or uh, whether it may go into the replication phase. Anyway, the in vitro assay I would still regard as a powerful tool uh, which should be used maybe in, for in-process testing, etc. cetera. Um, that's what I believe will not uh, be removed so fast. Whereas for the in vivo, um, I'm convinced that um, this assay uh, can be passed. And in the vaccine industry, especially in Europe, the EP have changed the, uh, have changed, uh, the mode Right now, when you're using an in vivo assay, you need to justify it. Um, and um, if you cannot justify, uh, you should not use it. Okay. And how can we measure viral clearance in a product that uses the helper virus during manufacture? The clearance of a helper virus, uh, usually you can do that in the downstream process. You know, uh, when we talk about helper virus, they are mainly used uh, in the production of AAV uh, uh, products. And um, you have a downstream process, and the benefit with the AAV, it's a very small virus, it's a parvo virus. Uh, whereas the um, helper virus, which are frequently used, uh, you know, it may be an adenovirus, it may be an herpes virus, et cetera, or baculovirus. They are uh, uh, envelope viruses and they are big viruses. So if you do a chromatography step, um, you definitely can separate because of the biophysical features of those viruses. You have probably the potential to separate, to remove the, um, the uh, helper virus without affecting your product. Just to mention, for AAV, because it's a small virus, there are some virus filter out, uh, for instance, the uh, 35 nanometer, where power virus walks through, but all the virus which are bigger do not walk through. So I would definitely recommend to use those filters because this way you purify the product from residual virus, which uh, and this is a, 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 a you know a, a huge number of virus you can remove this way because many virus have sizes greater than uh, 40 nanometers. Which reference database do you use to identify detected viruses, and how do you report and classify unknown viruses detected? Which database? Okay, um, I should mention that you know Charles River is collaborating with PatoQuest uh, uh, on, on when we are providing next generation sequencing solutions, and um, you know there are many discussions about and. Um, you know, can NGS be applied under GMP? But of course, is shortly before uh, getting the uh, certification for that. So they offer NGS solution under GMP. And what they do is they are not referring to the database, which are public, you know, they 
started with this uh, uh, with this database, but then they um, qualified those database and built their own database, which is frequently checked um, for what new uh, entries came into the public database and you know uh, update their internal database. But this da internal database, I'm talking about viral database, virus database is regularly is quality controlled and um, this way you can offer this service under uh, GMP um, and um, yeah the detection of unknown virus is you know what will happen because you sequence everything what is in your sample and you may find if an if there is an unknown virus um, it may have still some overlap with other viruses, maybe from the same family, from, from a virus family, uh, um, for instance. So uh, you will frequently still see some, um, some uh, uh, sequence homologies uh, to maybe other viruses, even, even though it might be low, but this gives you the first indication uh, that this could be a virus, and then uh, you need to do further investigation for sure. Uh, that can be more challenging, but again, you will have at the end the sequence in your sample, in your analytics, which is left, which may not fit to the data bank you may have, but I would assume still to some level, there might be some overlap and that may uh, put you on the right uh, track to find out what this virus is about. And then you definitely need to apply PCR, you know, but you have some sequence information and that will help you uh, in the follow-up investigations. Okay. For naked antibody use for cell therapy agents, you would also need to be assured of viral safety. So are two orthogonal steps like inactivation removal steps, is that sufficient? For recombinant, is that the question? Sorry, I didn't get the first, the, the first part of the question. It says for naked antibody use for cell therapy reagents. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, that's that's a good question. Um, <laughs> we frequently have with some of our clients producing raw materials or using those materials in, uh, for um, cell, cell therapy products uh, for uh, production. Um, <laughs> I don't. I hate to say case by case because you want to have an answer here. <laughs> and um, so, nevertheless. Uh, let me put a make it short a little bit. Yes, it might be sufficient. Uh, you know, if this material is uh, produced on Cho cell, which is you know we have experience on the Cho cells for almost 25 years now, so uh, we have we have a lot of experience with this cell line. And uh, if it's a standard process, which is all you use for uh, monoclonals uh, for therapeutic approaches, you know. Um, if you get good reduction by two steps, um, I would say that could be acceptable when it is used as a raw material in the production of another biopharmaceutical. However, I would be careful. So what is the production way? So we need to have some details and therefore don't take it as a, a general, rec uh, as a, a recommendation for what you are doing or you want to use it, etc. I need to be careful here, but um, I think the requirements for those, uh, if it's a virus filtration step, for instance, and if you have an inactivation step included, you know, both are regarded as robust inactivation steps, you may be fine with eight locks. Okay. So we have time for just one more question. If we didn't get to your question, the questions will be passed to you, or Stan, he will be able to talk okay. to you sure. directly. So go ahead and continue to ask any questions you have while while we're answering this last question. So the last question is, can you clarify what you were saying about um, applying NGS to cell banks? And um, do you see NGS use, being used for release testing? Yeah, as I mentioned, so my talk, and uh, thank you for this question because uh, uh, I want to make sure. So this was really focused on cell banks, cell substrates. Uh, using NGS to um, uh, bring in the safety um, to the cell substrates because they are so critical and they cannot be avoided and they cannot be treated. Um, and because this is a study material uh, you use, uh, you have time to do that. And that is the reason because NGS is 
uh, can be used as a release test, but it still takes time. Uh, it's less the processing of the sample, it's less the, the wet chemistry on it, um, but it takes time. And so uh, before you get a result in an idle world right now, it still may take two weeks before you get the results. And that is not the best condition for a release test, et cetera, if it takes that time. And um, and you know, release test is really um, um, more critical uh, because if you find a hit, you know, if you have just three hits, um, you need to evaluate whether this is relevant or not. Whereas if you are in the cell bank or substrate area, you have time to further investigate. Um, this is a risk. Uh, if you do use it as a release test, you know, then uh, everything would be delayed because the process is running. And um, however, I see it coming as a release test in the future for sure. And if it's somehow aligned with the findings in when you uh, analyze the substrate using NGS, you can maybe combine the two aspects, uh, you know, the outcome of the cell bank characterization and then related to any release testing, also NGS based. And then it can be, um, I think it will take less time in the future to do the analytics. And um, then you may not run into any risk that you get something what you cannot interpret. So I see in the future, I see it as a release test right now. There are a couple of technical requirements or technical discussion which are addressed in those uh, um, interest groups uh, to bypass. So there are a lot of activities to bring NGS to this level. Okay, great. Thanks, Horst. Thank you very much. And thank you to our audience for joining us. The recorded version of this webcast will be available for on-demand viewing on our website. And as a registered attendee, you'll receive a follow-up email providing us a direct link. We look forward to having you join us at future Bioprocess International Ask the Expert webcasts. Look for those announcements in your inbox. Goodbye.